Okay, here we are, elders, preachers, uh, deacons, saints. This is lesson number 12. The title of this lesson is The Role of Women in Ministry. So these are our last two sessions in this uh, series, one more uh, next week on our, uh, on our class and dealing with the elders, deacons, preachers, saints. Um, in the discussion about saints, because we're at that point now, we've talked about the other roles, we're going to talk about saints. I think it's appropriate to review an issue that is creating, you know, it creates turmoil in the church, and that is the role of women in the church or the role of women in ministry. It's uh, something that's been debated back and forth for a long time. And uh, I am thankful for a, a, a little booklet by Brother James Meadows, who summarized well some of the main arguments over the role of women in ministry in the, in the church. So if you read some articles, um, you would think that the debate over the role of women in the church began somewhere in the 80s or something. It's all a modern idea, you know, and uh, uh, along with women's uh, liberation movement, that's what you know, triggered it in the church. But actually the stresses and strains over the appropriate role for women to play in church life, especially in the area of public worship, is as old as the church itself. I mean, think back now. Paul the Apostle was already addressing the problem in the Corinthian church with instructions about women praying and women teaching in 1 Corinthians chapters 11 and chapters 14. So it's not like it's, an, it's a new issue. It's not like somebody came up with these questions or these problems you know, in the 20th century. Right at the very beginning, Paul is having to give instructions to the church about this particular issue. Now in our own brotherhood, the Churches of Christ, we read in the issues of a magazine or a periodical entitled The Christian Evangelist, of 1892, I repeat that, not 1992, 1892, 1893, there were debates by preachers of the day over the propriety of allowing women to preach in the church. That's in 1892, they were kind of debating this. Uh, in 1974, two churches sponsored a seminar entitled Women in Christ Today, where women were the keynote speakers and that the issue of being promoted or the issue being promoted was the right of women to be elders in the church or preachers or deacons in the church. So this has been going on for quite a while. Then of course in the late 80s and early 90s several churches in Alabama and Texas appointed female deacons with the stipulation that they would read scripture and lead prayer and serve communion and so on and so forth. So this is, you know, this is an ongoing discussion and I think it'll always you know, be an ongoing discussion. So the role of women in the church is a question and issue that has always been with the church and continues to be with us uh, today. So what's the problem? You know, uh, what is the problem exactly? The first thing to do is identify where the disagreement and the problems lie and then hopefully offer some biblical teaching to clear, to clear it up. So we're going to try to do that in this particular lesson today. Now there's no problem with women in the church, it's the role of women in ministry. So let's get that straight. You know, whenever you hear people say, oh, let's talk about the role of women in the church, that's like a non-issue. It's the role of women in ministry where there's the, the debate, where there's disagreement. In other words, what role do or should women play in ministry? And there are two sides to the argument. I'm going to try to present both sides. So the, the one side is called full ministry. That's the argument is based on the idea of full ministry. Now this is not a group, but rather an idea shared by a lot of different people. And basically a full ministry supporter would say that women should have the right to minister in any way that a man does. Let me get that slide up, there we go. They should be, um, uh, have the right to minister in any way that a man does. In other words, uh, they should be allowed to preach and uh, become deacons, even become shepherds or elders in the church. Full ministry, that's what it means. Uh, there are different, uh, different uh, levels of full ministry supporters within the group. 
the most extreme say a woman can minister in any task, full ministry, elders, deacons, you know, anything. And then there are others that believe, well, they should be able to minister as deacons only. Deacons and preaching, but not being elders. So there are even different levels of the full ministry argument. And usually, not always, but usually it's younger people and women who, um, who drive this, uh, this idea of full ministry. The other side is um, limited ministry. This has been the traditional position. It says that only the men should preach and shepherd and be appointed as deacons. Only men can lead in the worship, in public worship. And this position has been held by the majority uh, throughout history, not only us, but in many other uh, churches. So what are the arguments that support each side? Okay. Obviously those who support you know, either side have their arguments to promote their idea. So let's go back to the full ministry side and let's, uh, let's look at the arguments that, you know, that, that people put forth to support the idea that women should be allowed to perform any ministry in the church. The first one and most popular one is called the cultural argument. Primary argument for full ministry is the one that says God created women and men equal but in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the status of women at that time, in that culture, resulted from layers of rabbinical interpretations and the prejudices of a patriarchal social structure. In other words, the argument is that it was the custom of the Jewish culture that women were subordinate to men, and this custom was reflected in their religion and it carried on until today. And we know that in the Jewish society of the first century, for example, women had no property rights, they, they, they could not sue for divorce, only a man could you know, divorce his wife, but a woman couldn't divorce her husband, you know, that was the law. And many other types of social restrictions on women that we don't have in our society today. So the cultural argument is all the things that are in the New Testament limiting women they're, they spring from a cultural bias of the time. Paul was a Jew, he lived in a Jewish society, and so he wrote, you know, as a Jew living in that society, and his cultural bias you know, flowed through his, uh, his uh, writing. Since this custom is changing, the uh, proponents of the full ministry side say, since this custom is changing in our society today, it should also change in the church. Today, women have property rights. Women can sue for divorce. Women you know, can uh, uh, be in perhaps almost any role that a man has, a woman can fulfill. A woman can be president. There's one who's going to be running for president. You know, that's, that's permitted in our, in our society. And so the argument is we should, the church should change with the times. It should adapt to the culture of today. All right? So that's pretty much the cultural argument. Another argument for full ministry is the Phoebe argument. Romans chapter 16, verses one and two. In this particular passage, Phoebe, a sister in the, in the church there, is referred to as a deaconess in Romans 16, one and two. And so this is proving that women held this position in the early church. Now, uh, the argument goes, if women could be deacons, at the very least, they can lead prayer and teach and do the things that some of the deacons did. Philip, for example, he was a deacon and then he went on to, to preach. So, so the argument says, well, if Phoebe was a deaconess, she should have been able to serve and do stuff. And if she wanted to go preach, well, she should be able to preach too. So there's the Phoebe argument, Romans 16. Then there's the uh, we are all equal argument based on Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. We are one in Christ, no, ma neither male nor female, we're one in Christ. So the argument here is that this passage just teaches that we are all equal in Christ. And as the argument goes, if slaves were free, if Jew and Greek were put on the same footing, 
The idea that men and women are equal means that each should have access to the same ministry roles in the church as well. So if we're all one in Christ, neither male nor female, well it should mean that in the church, neither male nor female, either male or female can preach and teach and lead and so on and so forth. And that's how the argument goes. I mean, I could spend you know, more time you know, taking this argument and giving all the sub ideas, but that's basically the equal argument based on chapter three, verse 26 in Galatians. If we're one in Christ, we're equal, it means we should have equal responsibilities in the church. And then number four is the example argument. And the, that argument goes like this. The Old Testament has many examples of women who ministered as prophets and leaders. Miriam, for example, Moses' sister. Deborah, who was a judge in Israel. Anna, the prophetess. Well, you know, if these women could serve in those roles, well then women should be able to serve in leadership, leadership type roles in the church today. And the argument says, God used women in dynamic ministries and can still use them today, but it is the man, not God, who denies them their potential role in ministry because women are just as qualified as men are. And that is actually the basis of the argument. The basis of the argument for full ministry for women is that it is because of men that women have been held back in ministry of the church. God wants them to minister, but it's you know, the prejudice of men and social custom and so on and so forth that has held women back in ministry in the church. And this is, you know, uh, this is a very strong argument and in many churches um, it, uh, it goes on and on. All right. Let's talk about uh, limited ministry now, the other side. I personally believe and support the notion that there is a limited ministry role for women in the church. And um, uh, I want to give reasons why by responding to the arguments made by the full ministry supporters. If you came in late and you're wondering, what is Mike talking about? <laughs> I'm, I'm giving two sides of an argument. So that's one side, the full ministry side the reasons why some people uh, argue for full ministry for women in the church. So let's look at the limited ministry side and take the arguments one at a time, once again. The cultural argument. The cultural, remember what the cultural argument is. In, in that day and time, in the culture of the first century, for example, it was a cultural bias against women. We've grown out of that and so on and so forth. So the answer to that is, what is written in the Bible is the product of inspiration, not culture. Yes, Paul the Apostle was a man, yes, but he was an inspired man when he wrote the scriptures. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, you know, he says, every scripture is inspired uh, by God, every scripture. So even the scriptures that talk about the role of women in the church, in the Bible, those scriptures, they're inspired as well, aren't they? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, what does Peter say? He says, men were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, they spoke uh, move, being moved by the Holy Spirit. So both Peter and Paul talk about the idea that the scriptures may have been written by men, you know, com composed by men, they wrote it, but they were writing under the influence of the uh, Holy Spirit. It was written by people in a cultural context, of course, but its instructions and commands are inspired from God, not social customs. If the Bible is just a book and it's not inspired, well then okay, I go with you, I go on the idea of culture. If it was just a book written just by men, of course, their, prejudice, their prejudices would find their way into their writings. But we claim that the Bible, or the Bible itself rather, claims of itself that it's an inspired work. That Peter was inspired and Paul was inspired and Luke was inspired. Inspired writings. For example, the New Testament instructions that limit a woman's ministry in the area of public worship and leadership in the church is based on a creation principle, not a cultural principle. 
For example, let me ask these questions. Is it cultural when Paul says, the head of the woman is man? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse three. Is that a cultural argument he's making or is that a creation argument? What about the same statement in the very same verse that says, the head of Christ is God? Is that cultural? Because it's in the very same verse. See what I'm saying? And then uh, Paul says um, that women are to be under obedience as also says the law in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 34. Is that cultural? Is that a cultural thing that he says? Or is he appealing to the scripture itself? He's saying according to the word of God, women are to be in submission. Not according to cultural bias, according to the word of God. How about where it says, the husband is the head of the wife, Ephesians 5 verse 23. Is that just cultural? Or is that an inspired biblical idea? If it's cultural, then how do we explain his comparison in the very same verse where he says, even as Christ is head of the church? Is that cultural? You see what I'm saying? You can't have it, you can't have it both ways. You, you can't go and pick up one thing and pull it out and just you know, make your argument on that. You can't only just pull out half of that verse that says the husband's the head of the wife you know, and say, oh, well, that's just cultural bias. A good Bible interpretation says, well, let's take the entire verse out and let's take a look at that verse. He's comparing the relationship of the husband and the wife to the relationship between God or Christ and the church. And he's balancing them. As Christ is the head of the church, so is the husband the head of the wife. And then he goes on to beautifully explain how that is so. And how that is a God thing, not a, not a, not a cultural thing. Because you see, if, it, if, it's, if this part is cultural, then it's all cultural. You can't have it both ways. You can't do that when you interpret the scriptures. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, he says, women are not to teach or usurp authority over the man, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. So in this verse, Paul explains the basis for the order that God has established in the home as well as in the church. He doesn't just say it, he explains it. It is this order that provides the context for interpreting every other verse in the Bible regarding the role of ministry of women, not just in the, in the church, but in the home as well. And Jesus did the same thing when He questioned about divorce, right? When the, when the Pharisees questioned Him about divorce and they wanted to know, you know, is it legal to divorce? They were just looking at it from Deuteronomy 24. You know, they're just legal. They were looking at legal. So what is Jesus doing? Well, He says from the beginning, He goes back to the original premise in, in Genesis to establish the basic. What's the ideal? Well, one man, one woman for life. You know, that's the ideal at the beginning. So what does Paul do when challenged with a question about the role of women in ministry? Well, he, he goes back to the beginning. He goes back to creation. How was it at creation? Who set it up this way and when was it set up? You know, there, are, there are pressures today to change the rules and style of marriage, but Christians are bound by the model in the Bible. You know, to say you know, today you know, gay marriage is a big issue, it's going to the Supreme Court, and you know what, they may pass it. The Supreme Court may just say, yep, that's legal. Gays are allowed to marry. I mean, you know, two men could get married and two women can get married. And who knows what that will, who knows what that will lead to? And people are saying, well, as a Christian, what do I say? Well, you say the same thing you've always said. <laughs> that in the beginning, <laughs> creation, Genesis, God created man and He created women and one man, one woman for life. That hasn't changed. Society changes but the Bible never changes. That's our answer. Let's hope we don't get locked up for saying that. I can't guarantee you won't be sued or locked up, 
But I can guarantee that you'll be giving the correct answer anyways. From the beginning, it was not so that two men or two women could be married. And I, I don't even want to go there, that's a whole other subject, we'll save that for, for another time. Jesus did not legislate for the role of women in society. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible only legislates for the role of women in ministry in the church and in the home. If a woman aspires to be the president of this nation, she has every right to do so. She is not um, violating any biblical principle in doing so. Women are in the military, they're in corporate America, they're professors in colleges and universities. You know, there is no role, virtually no role, which is denied to women in our society. Um, and there's been a lot of progress in making sure that you know, equal work, equal pay, you know, that, that's fair, that's, the Bible demands that, a just balance. The Bible simply legislates about the role of women and men, not just women, but the role of men and women in the home, in the family, and in the church. All right, so what's the answer to the cultural argument? Well, the answer to the cultural argument is that the things that are written in the scriptures are written by inspiration, not by culture. How about the, um, the Phoebe argument, Romans 16, 1, it says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at uh, uh, Chancrea. Notice it says a servant. One version, some versions say a servant, some versions say a deaconess. The word deacon used to describe her is a common word in the Greek, used to describe any servant. It's the same Greek word used to describe the ones who fill the water pots at the wedding at Cana. You know, when Jesus said to Mary, Mary said to the servants, you know, do what he says, and they went and filled the water pots. Same word here is used for Phoebe as, as those people. It's even used to describe the emperor Nero in Romans uh, chapter 13, verse six. You know, that the head of the state is the servant of, of God. Also used to refer to special servants in the church as well. So the use of this word to describe Phoebe simply means that she was a good and trusted servant or messenger, which all Christians should be. There's no reference or qualification or example in the New Testament of a woman serving as a deacon, and the first deaconesses only appeared hundreds of years after the end of the New Testament period. That's an important thing to remember, those who argue for uh, you know, a, a full role of ministry for women in the church, many times the arguments that they cite are from some church father or some, from some history of the church where they see in the third century or the fourth century, there's some mention of women having some, you know, some sort of leadership role in the church. I don't deny that. But you don't see any evidence of that in the scriptures. When they're talking about the church the apostolic church, you know, the church as it existed at the very beginning with the apostles alive, all of their instructions, all of their examples exclude any role of leadership for women in the church. And Paul tells us in Acts 20 that you know, it won't be long before you know, we begin to fall away. The apostasy begins right away in the first century. False teaching, false teachers, mistaken teachings. I'm not attributing malice to anybody who thinks this way. I'm not saying they're bad people and they want to destroy the church. I'm just saying uh, I, I believe that they're misinterpreting the scriptures to uh, come to the conclusions that they wish to come to. Um, in, the, in the New Testament, we have direct commands. I mean, a direct command. When Paul says, I do not want women to usurp the authority of a man in the church or to teach, I mean, that's a direct command. That's pretty strong stuff. So we have direct commands, we have lengthy teaching, and we also have numerous examples of men being singled out to be deacons 
And so when we have a clear teaching, we're supposed to go with one, uh, with what is written. In other words, if you have 10 very clear teachings on a subject that point to one conclusion and one obscure teaching that might point to a different conclusion, what are you going to go with? I don't know about you, but I'm going to go with the 10 very clear instructions that point to that teaching. You know, the Phoebe argument is not a very, very strong argument. It is not prejudiced or chauvinism to say that there is nothing in the New Testament to support the role of women as deacons. It's simply a matter of record and simply uh, inspired record that we are all subject to obey as Christians. I mean, in Romans 16, 1, it could refer to Phoebe as an official deacon or a trusted servant, one of the two. All the other passages point to her being a trusted servant. So we go with that one. You know, it's better to go with the 99 pieces of evidence that point to a, logical, uh, to a logical conclusion than to the one obscure idea that may point somewhere else. That's just, that's not the only passage where we have you know, difficulty in, in interpreting. It's a kind of rule of interpretation. You go with the passages that most clearly define the, the subject that you're trying to understand. Okay, let's look at equal. What about equal? It says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. He goes on to say that, and that's where the equal argument is based. So the Bible supports and promotes that men and women are equal, contrary to social custom of the times. So the Bible, far from being a misogynist document that supports you know, male domination of women, as some people say, is the opposite. The scriptures have done more to free women from the slavery and the unfairness of the society that they lived in at the time. And this passage is, is uh, 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 one passage that does that. You know, Christianity is the religion that promoted the equal value of women to men long before it was a social issue uh, like the women's movement. So if you use this scripture to say, women are equally valuable as men are in the eyes of God, you are correctly you know, interpreting this passage. Now in our society, that's not a big deal, but in societies where women are treated like slaves, like property and so on and so forth, this is a powerful passage. God, through His inspired servant, says, men and women are of equal value. That's a very important statement. So the distinction that the Bible makes, however, is that men and women have different roles to play. Some different because of nature. Obviously, women can have children, so that role goes to them. And some are different because of their assignment by God. In other words, the role of the man and the woman in the family, the role of the man and the woman in the church. Who, who assigns those roles? Not man, God assigns the roles. So men and women are equally saved when they are not united to Christ through baptism, but they do not discard their natural or assigned roles. Once you become a Christian, you're still a female, you're still having babies. And once you become a Christian, uh, then you are studying the scriptures to understand, well, what exactly is my role in the church? How can I serve? Where can I serve? And how can I live my life as a woman, a Christian woman, a woman of faith, as a, as a wife, a faithful Christian wife and a faithful Christian mother? How, how, do I, you know, how do I do that? The Bible makes clear that submission to the husband or insubmission while learning in the church does not mean inferiority. And that's really the sub-argument for the full ministry people they are presuming that if you're talking about limited ministry for women in the church, that you, for some reason, consider women inferior to men, and then nothing could be further from the truth. You know, the role assigned by God is one that must be accepted freely in order to be legitimate. If you don't accept the role freely, then, well, you're a slave. So the man must accept freely 
to provide holy and loving leadership in the home and in the church. And having been a preacher for 35 years, I can tell you that not all men take to that very easily. <laughs> and women must accept freely to place themselves in submission in the home and in the church. And it's the same way there. I can tell you that a lot of women don't, just don't take naturally to that idea. So God has created man and woman equal in value and in human potential for good. In certain contexts, both men and women can exercise their talents and abilities freely and without restraint, as I said before. Sports, business, politics, you know, every area of the world. But God has ordained, however, that in the family and in the church, each sex will play a specific role and not necessarily one that comes easily or naturally to them. You know, for, for, for some men, leadership um, does not come easily and it does not come naturally to them. It's, it's easier for them to kind of let others take the lead and you know, they're just passive in their nature and in their character. So it's just easier for them to let their wives kind of call the shots, take the leadership role, you know, they just rather let that go. And in the same way, for some women, submission goes completely against their nature. They're strong-willed and they're powerful and they have a lot of leadership qualities. So for them to be in submission to their husband requires an act of the will that says, I will do this, I will encourage my husband to take leadership, I'll support him in this. He's not even as good a leader as I could be. But the scripture asks me to take this role, and so I will take this role, and I will take it freely, and I will support my husband in the role that God has given him. It's a question of will. God supplies the grace and the strength to mold our individual personalities into His will in order to honor Him. Because in the end, a husband that provides holy and loving leadership not only honors his wife and his family, but also honors God. And it's the same way when the woman is in submission to her husband. She does so in order to honor God. It's her way of saying, I believe. You know, in Romans 12, 1, 2, Paul says we shouldn't be conformed to this world, but we should be transformed. And many times, you know, whether it's taking leadership or accepting submissive role, that's the transformation that's necessary. I'm sure that it did not come easily to Jesus to submit to a disgraceful public execution. <laughs> I'm sure that, that's not something he thought that that was really fun. And we know about his prayer in the garden, you know, his human side was saying, Lord, really? <laughs> really? Can, is there not another way? So God requires, and why? For the sake of order and peace and edification that equal people take on these roles and we honor him when we do so freely and joyfully. Because I've, I've said, I've also heard in classes, you know, uh, some women, you know, they'll, we'll talk about the role of women, the role of men in the home or something like that. And uh, some women will say, um, yeah, 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 I'm in submission. You know, I, let, I let him do what he wants you know, until I decide better. <laughs> Not exactly the right spirit. <laughs> Not exactly the right spirit. All right, we need, we need to get along here. Okay, and the other one here is examples of women in, in leadership. I just want to get away from the debate here and talk a little more positively about women in leadership. The argument says that uh, women uh, ministered in leadership roles uh, is simply inaccurate. In other words, you know the argument that, well, we had a lot of women leaders in the Bible. In his book, All the Women of the Bible, Dr. Herbert Lockyer says, that in the 260 references where women are named or referred to in the Bible, there is not a single case where a woman was in a leadership role in the worship of Jehovah. Not a single case out of 260 references. In some specific cases like Anna, who prophesied in the temple, 
But you have to remember that in the temple there was a partition that separated the men from the women in the temple and so she may have done so to women on a regular basis. That's still prophecy, that's still ministry. They talk about Deborah in the Old Testament. She was a judge, she gave judgment over Israel, but what do they call her? She was a mother in Israel, always maintaining a maternal urgency and a maternal imagery. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about women praying and prophesying and gives instructions about how, he doesn't say they need to stop doing this, he gives instructions on how they should continue to do it. So in 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 1 Timothy 2, 8, Paul says that women are not to speak, teach, or have authority over a man in the church. So did he contradict himself? In Corinthians he says, okay, you women who are prophesying and teaching and so on and so forth, you need to cover your heads and da da da. He says that. And then in 1 Timothy he says, okay, you women need to be silent in the church. No teaching. You shouldn't teach men and so on. So he, is he contradicting himself? You know, the full ministry people seem to think so. But a more simple explanation is to conclude that in the first century, a church, like in the synagogues, because first century church organization and worship reflected very much the, the synagogue style, if you wish. And like we do today, the women edified each other and when this happened, those who prayed and prophesied at those occasions wore a veil to demonstrate their ongoing submissive attitudes despite the demonstration of their gifts and leadership among the women. So there were women who had gifts of teaching and prophecy and leadership and they exercised those gifts in a correct manner to the other women uh, in the church. And in order to demonstrate their humble attitude, they wore a veil as a reminder that yes, I am standing up and I am teaching and I am prophesying, but I am also doing so under the lordship, overseeing and oversight of the leaders in the church. That explains both scriptures together. Today, we don't use the veil in our society, but women who exercise their talents and gifts for leadership in our children's programs or women's Bible studies and various benevolence and service projects demonstrate their submissive attitudes in the way they act and by working under the oversight of our elders. You know, the oversight of the elders provides the cover, it's the veil today for Christian women of today. That's why we ask you know, the elders to review programs, ideas, so on and so forth, that all of us do, both men and women. So let me summarize here, a lot of time and energy spent in discussing the few areas where God, not man, has limited women in a certain area of ministry. There's so many other important ministry roles where women can serve equally, if not more effectively, than men. For example, whoops. Will it go backwards? Well, I'll just leave it there. First three, not here, but first three, the ministry to the ill and elderly, those who are alone. A ministry of teaching to children and women. The ministry of mentoring younger women and especially younger wives and mothers. You know, I asked the women here, who's your mentor in the Lord and who are you mentoring in the Lord? And then uh, the ministry there we go, thank you. And then the ministry as wives of elders and deacons and preachers and the responsibilities that go with that role. Ministry of evangelism, Priscilla and Aquila teaching Apollos. And I see when I go on college campuses all these wonderful young Christian women who go into mission work. You know, all such opportunities in mission work. Ministry of hospitality in the home, in the church as greeters, you know, no limit there. The ministry of service. Any service a man can do, a woman can do. You know, I don't see any battle of the sexes to mow the lawn. <laughs> I never see anybody arguing over that. I don't see any men and women fighting over who's going to climb up and change the sign you know, when it's 20 below zero. I don't see anybody fighting over that one. I don't see anybody fighting, I don't see any of the men fighting the women to go in and clean up after a potluck or clean out the nursery. I don't see, I don't see any fighting going on there. No, I want to do it. No, I want to clean the dishes. No, I want to clean. No. You know, I, in our congregation, we, we, Jenny Anthony is going to create a, a board, a bulletin board there that features our With Love from Choctaw ministry, that's our you know, service ministry. 
And so far we have 20, count them, 20 different ministries under the With Love from Choctaw banner. And if I'm not mistaken, all of them are led by or run by women in, the, in this congregation. 20, 20 ministries. Visitation ministry, fixing houses ministry, food ministry, how about the uh, ministry, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the meal that uh, Peggy, and, uh, Peggy Davis and her group puts together for, for funerals. I've seen her put together a meal for 50 or 60 or 75 people on a 24 hour notice. Boy, she gets her crew together, boom. And the people who come here, some of them not even members of this church. We provide the funeral and then we feed them a hot meal afterwards and it costs them not a dime. And they walk away from here saying, what a church, what a, how wonderful this church, what they did for us and how they treated us. And who does that? Well, the women in the church. Not only women, a lot of men in that ministry that help, that help out. I'm just trying to say so much, there's so much to do. There shouldn't be any uh, arguing over that. So let me just let you go with a couple of things here to think about. Three appeals. First, that women accept the biblical role in ministry with grace and humility and honor God in doing so. He blesses those who humble themselves. Remember that. He blesses those who humble themselves. Also remember, exercise existing opportunities. That women exercise the opportunities for ministry that do not exist, or excuse me, that do exist and that are sufficient to satisfy and edify. You know, in other words, there's plenty to do here that, where there's no arguing. Plenty to do where there's no arguing and where we need help. And then finally, that all women realize that their number one ministry is the saving of their own souls and the souls of their husbands and their children. There are plenty of opportunities for ministry even in their own, in their own homes with their own families. Plenty of work to do. Okay, so that's our special class on this particular topic. Know that we haven't touched every single thing, but hopefully giving you some information about uh, this, uh, this debate and perhaps a, a, a firmer resolve uh, in, uh, in serving the Lord, whether you're a man or a woman. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention.